The material contained in this book synthesizes what you need to learn to prepare for a successful career in mass communications. It is sad to note, however, that many journalism graduates enter the job market never having fully mastered these simple basics. It would be to your advantage to go over this material until you start repeating it in your sleep. Then you will be ready to begin refining your reporting, writing, and editing techniques as an intern and then as a professional. Certainly not every discovery, new program, new proposal, new assertion, and new thought could be carried in the news media. Yet, loosely speaking, it is all news. And in actuality, a lot of what is overlooked by journalists every day could be as newsworthy as that which does appear in the news media. From what events they are aware of, journalists try to choose the most newsworthy to actually present to the public as news. They usually start off with the happenings of the day, which from experience they presume to be of most importance or of interest to the public. These stories are also some of the easiest stories to cover with limited staffing. The journalists cover specific beats, gathering news from crime blotters, government meetings, speeches and press conferences, strikes and rallies. Sometimes instead of starting with an event, the journalist will start with an issue. The journalist's reporting of an issue makes it news even if no one other than that journalist has ever thought about it before. Another alternative is to interview an individual and allow him to create the news of the day. The reporter may have no idea what the person is going to say, but for some reason, he suspects the public would be interested in that individual's opinions and insights. The individual may be famous, powerful, highly credible, or just interesting. But for whatever reason, the journalist decides that person is news, almost regardless of what he says. Basic news values are considered when determining what should or should not become part of today's news. Timeliness, for example. What is closest to now is generally of the most interest. If something is of too distant past or future, there is little public interest. Proximity. What is closest to us generally is of the most interest. An accident in our community is of greater newsworthiness to us than an accident in a city a thousand miles away. Proximity may be social or cultural, as well as geographic. For example, civil strife in Europe is of more interest to most Americans than civil strife in Africa. One could ask, in a new sense, how many Indonesians are equal to one member of my own community? In other words, how many Indonesians would have to die to bump a story about a local fatal traffic accident from the front page? Pathos. Stories that tug at the heartstrings have a special appeal to many news consumers. People like to feel. Crying over someone else's problems is much better than being bored with one's own. Humor. We all need some comic relief amid otherwise serious news. News stories with a humorous angle, therefore, are in high demand by consumers and editors. Love. Tender emotions stirred by children, animals, or an attractive person frequently enhance a story's value similar to pathos. Achievement. Victory or great accomplishment is appealing to news consumers. This is especially so if the consumer feels a part of the achievement. The victory of someone from one's own country in the Olympics, for example, is typically of greater interest than a victory by an athlete from another country. Prominence. An event involving a prominent person is generally of more interest than a similar event involving someone of little notoriety. By definition, the more prominent a person is, the more people will feel they know him personally, that somehow he is a part of their life. Suspense. Stories concerning crime, conflict, or survival are often more newsworthy because of the element of suspense. People project themselves into the situation as they do with a movie thriller or a novel. Such stories are usually never over in one day, but require follow-up coverage to satisfy long-term consumer interest. Curiosity. Oddities and unusual happenings appeal to the public's curiosity. Great curiosity is stirred by things for which we have no satisfactory intellectual explanation. UFOs, ghosts, magic, miracles, but also everyday occurrences such as crimes, incidents, and basically anything we call news. Certainly curiosity must be one of the strongest news values. And finally, consequence. If there is a stronger news appeal than curiosity, it is probably consequence. We are curious about some strange thing happening on the other side of the world, but we are much more concerned if we think it may affect us. The power of proximity is rooted primarily in consequence. What is near to us is more likely to affect us than that which is far away and thus probably of little personal consequence. News values are basic human values and emotions that extend far beyond the news. All communications are influenced by them. Religion, education, art, marketing, entertainment, fiction, and even gossip rely on these human appeals. The key to gathering information effectively is to ask questions. The right questions to the right people until you obtain the right answers. You must be prepared to ask your questions quickly, but without leaving any dangling, unanswered questions to undermine your efforts. It helps to bone up in your subject and on your sources in order to have intelligent questions prepared ahead of time and in order to interpret the responses intelligently after the interview. 
Whether or not you have time to prepare, don't forget the basic five W's. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. If you forget one of these questions or fail to pursue it adequately, you will have a big hole in your story. Memorize the five W's and really use them. Recognize, however, what it means to pursue the question. If you ask who broke into the Watergate and the Democratic National Headquarters, don't forget to ask who put them up to it and who is trying to cover it up or you will fall short of your journalistic responsibility. Pursue, pursue, pursue. How and why are the two most neglected questions? Why did it happen? Why did they do it? Why isn't somebody doing anything about it? Why are you giving me the runaround? Precisely how did it occur detail by detail? How does this compare currently and historically? How would you feel if it happened to you? How did you arrive at that conclusion? Why do you reject this other possibility? How would you resolve this problem? How would you explain this to a layman, perhaps a high school student? How would you persuade the opposition? How would you summarize your position or explanation? How would you summarize your opponent's position? Perhaps it is impossible to ask all the questions you would like to ask, but don't be too easily satisfied. There are literally hundreds of questions to be asked and usually hundreds of sources who could answer at least some of the questions, each in a very different way. Certainly most journalists, young and old, err in asking too few questions of too few people. And don't forget to pursue your non-people sources too. Libraries, government and other public records, and when available, private documents. Learn your rights under the various state and federal sunshine laws, laws regarding open public records and open public meetings. It doesn't do much good to ask questions, however, if you fail to report answers fully and accurately. Quote them when possible. In most cases, your story should be 20 to 40 percent direct quote. The rest can be indirect quote, paraphrase, summary, or direct observation. But just about everything not personally observed by the reporter should be attributed to someone else. Again, attribute essentially everything. Quote, summarize, quote, summarize, quote, summarize, quote. You can mix it up a little, but in writing a news story, the more quotes you have to choose from, the better. Direct quotes are important. They carry greater credibility and they humanize the source. The difference between paraphrase and direct quote is essentially the same difference as between a TV anchorman telling about a speech by the president as opposed to the TV audience seeing and hearing the speech on video. It's difficult for reporters to make the best decisions in their note-taking while rapidly trying to keep pace with the speaker. What I find is that many reporters, particularly new reporters, start writing down a quote, hear something else of interest, abandon the first quote, and start a second, then abandon that quote for yet a third. They can go through an entire hour-long interview with no complete quotes at all. I think direct quotes are very valuable in a story. Some journalists do not. I think accuracy is very important. Some journalists are not as meticulous as I am. Indeed, one award-winning New York Times reporter told me he doesn't take any notes while interviewing people. He's afraid that will cause sources not to be as forthright as if the reporter talks to them casually and maintains eye contact. After the interview, he quickly finds a spot where he can write down all the information he has been able to retain in his memory. Different professionals have different approaches. All that said, here are some tips for your note-taking. While taking notes, listen carefully. When you hear a good quote, capture it in your mind and write it down quickly while you're only half listening to the ongoing discussion. If you don't know formal shorthand or speed writing, speed up your note-taking by leaving out words like a an or the and any other words you think you can fill in later. You can also learn to leave out letters within words, particularly vowels, and still be able to decipher your notes later. Be pragmatic. Understand that you won't have time to take down all the notes you would like. It is better to get a half dozen complete quotes than two dozen half quotes. After your interview, you can still do what the New York Times reporter suggested and quickly write down all the other information you can use for indirect quotes and paraphrases. Be sure to keep track which notes are quotes and which are paraphrases. Be as careful with your quote taking as possible, but don't be too frustrated by perfectionism. I tell new reporters to be accurate enough so the source will not know whether you're exactly right or not. Think about a conversation you had yesterday. How exact is your own memory? You probably don't remember every word you used, but you do remember the essence and the intent of what you said. So if a reporter is a few words off, the source probably won't know or care as long as the essence is accurate. Most professional reporters feel they have the obligation to both their sources and their readers to do some quote doctoring anyway, cutting down run-on sentences, correcting grammar, cutting out dead wood and irrelevant information, etc. Many reporters combine separate partial quotes into a single complete quote and don't bother to use an ellipsis, dot, 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 to indicate missing information in between. Others question the ethics of marrying such quotes, especially if there is a lot of material separating the quotes, or if the marriage changes the sense of the quote. 
Again, the key, I believe, is whether the source himself will know the difference. If most of the words are quoted accurately and the essence of a quote is true, it should be okay. That gives you quite a bit of latitude, but be sure not to misrepresent the source. It's possible to take a precise and accurate quote even out of a recorded interview and misrepresent the intent of the source. That's not fair, even if accurate. Find your whammy. Your whammy is the most interesting item in your notes. It is the aspect most likely to grab your reader's attention and pull them into the story. It is the item you believe should, therefore, be featured in the headline and in your first paragraph, the lead of the story. I ask my writers and my students to write a prospective headline at the top of their stories before they start writing the story itself. It helps them to identify their whammy, and it sometimes suggests how to word their lead paragraph. At the same time, it may help an editor in creating the actual headline to be used in the newspaper. However, don't be confused. The headline is not part of the story, and not normally the reporter's job to write. For a long time it was taught that a summary of all the five W's should be included in the lead, the first paragraph. However, research has shown that lead paragraphs longer than 25 to 35 words lose readership. They appear too long graphically, they are intimidating, they are not easily skimmed, they dilute the impact of the whammy. Therefore, it is better to have a short, high-impact lead of 25 words emphasizing the whammy, and then to finish the summary of the remaining five W's in the second paragraph, sometimes in a third paragraph. Accordingly, you should think of the first two paragraphs as your complete lead, and your first paragraph, almost never more than one sentence, as simply your lead. Your story then extends out of your complete lead in what is referred to as inverted pyramid style. Your most important information has already been included in the complete lead, but now you essentially begin the story again, but in more detail, working your way down until you reach your least important detail in the very last paragraph. Readers rarely read an entire newspaper story, so provide them with the most important information first. Also, when space is tight, editors will cut your story from the tail end. Your story should be written so that it can be cut anywhere past the second paragraph and still sound somewhat complete. In fact, a typical radio news story wouldn't have more than three paragraphs of, of about two sentences apiece, in other words, six total sentences, and even a major television story may be limited to eight paragraphs or about 16 sentences. So a newspaper's complete lead of three to five sentences is not that much shorter than some broadcast news stories. Here are a few more tips to remember. Simplicity is a journalistic virtue. Newspaper readers have a wide educational range that must be served, but even for the most sophisticated reader, simplicity is appreciated. Newspaper readers are skimmers. If your writing is too complex, readers will simply go on to another story. So, keep sentences simple. Don't use more than two clauses in any one sentence. If there is more to say, break it into a separate sentence. Keep vocabulary simple. If precise jargon must be used, define it clearly for your readers. Your writing should be about junior high level. Your topic may be complex, but your writing must not be. Eliminate any cute, flowery, profound, or verbose language. Professionals are primarily concerned with the facts and use creative writing techniques with restraint. Short paragraphs. Never have paragraphs over three sentences long, generally one to two sentences. Paragraphs must be cut down from standard English composition or readers will not read them in a newspaper. A standard English paragraph might run eight inches long when set in a narrow two-inch newspaper column. That would appear too complex for typical newspaper skimmers to undertake. Bone up on your basic spelling, punctuation, and grammar. That is the number one complaint of editors. Don't guess. If in doubt, look it up. If too much needless editing has to be performed in your copy, your job is in jeopardy. When the story is complete, read it to yourself to check grammar and continuity. If a sentence sounds at all awkward to you, it will certainly sound worse to your editor and to your readers. Because you know what you intend to write, your mind will often fill in missing words, overlook typos, and not catch misspellings or poor grammar. One method to keep your mind from filling in those blanks is to read backwards through your story one sentence at a time, starting with the very last sentence. Another strategy, if your deadline will allow it, is to put your story aside and come back to it a few hours later or maybe even a day later. Learn newspaper style. In order to avoid apparent conflicts in style, most publications have adopted some standard, such as the AP style book, which you should be using in conjunction with this workbook. Again, don't guess. There's one kind of writer who is sure to make an editor angrier than one with poor punctuation and spelling skills. That's one who doesn't care. Someone who perhaps even has superior English skills, but who guesses when uncertain. Someone who is simply floppy. 
Someone who makes errors and thinks it's someone else's problem. A dictionary and an AP style book should be by your computer or available online at all times. And the best journalists make frequent use of both companions.